Hey everybody, welcome to Every I Think. Today our guest is an inspiring young woman who is not only a beauty queen but also a humanitarian who has spoken at over 200 schools raising awareness for her advocacies. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the amazing Miss Coastal Vancouver and Miss Charity Vancouver, Christine Jameson. <laughs> I'm good. How about yourself? I'm good, thank you. I like your crown. It's so pretty. Thank you. You're like a princess. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so first things first, I know that you are the, a co-founder of an organization. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So um, in 2011, I co-founded um, Faces of Mental Illness, or FOMI, um, which um, focuses on raising awareness about mental health. Um, it basically came about um, over the internet. Um, so I was talking to this girl down in Atlanta, Georgia, oh, wow. and um, we were talking about how people are a lot more comfortable talking about how they feel over the internet. And so we ended up making a video, um, and it just sort of took off from there. Um, so we work sort of as community consultants, that's sort of what our organization does, um, working um, with different um, groups or projects in order to let them have a different perspective on mental health. Some yeah. things we're involved in is, um, like I'm involved in a project with a really large telecommunications company right now, working on a mental health app. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Nice. Um, I work with um, the Provincial Eating Disorders Awareness Foundation, um, and just things like that. Oh, that's really cool. And I know that you also speak, uh, as I said earlier, introducing you, you've spoken at over like 200 schools, right, about all sorts of different things. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and like what motivated you to talk uh, to kids about this? Yeah, um, it's been like an amazing opportunity to ha like be able to speak yeah. to so many people. Um, I think at such a young age, we're taught to have a healthy body, but nobody ever teaches us to take care of our minds. True. Um, and I went through a really interesting journey with my mental health during high school. And I wish somebody had told me how to take care of my mental health and that it's okay to know that you do have mental health. So um, a couple of years ago, I decided, well, if somebody had said that to me, maybe I wouldn't have gone um, as far as my mental illness wouldn't have gone as far as it did. So I went back to my old school and was like, hey, can I come talk to you guys about this? I think it's really important. And I was really lucky that they said yes. I don't think if they had taken that leap of faith in me, I wouldn't be nearly as far as I was. Um, but from there, it just sort of took off. I've gotten calls from businesses, organizations, uh, schools all across Canada, a couple in the States to come speak to them about really at a high school or um, even an older level about what having mental health really means. You go, girl. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Oh, my gosh. So, um, sorry. So, um, of all of the different advocacies to support, what made you choose mental health? Um, when I was 15, I started suffering um, with depression, anxiety, and disordered eating. Um, I was walking home one day, and it just sort of, like, hit me, um, like, really hard. Like, I had this huge panic attack, and, like, I had to, like, sit down for, like, an hour, and it was... Um, I had no idea what was going on because it wasn't something anybody had talked to me about. And when I tried, um, I tried to hide it for a couple of months and then I tried to talk to my parents about it and it was not really something I could explain to them because the language wasn't there. Yeah. Um, and then it got to a point where I couldn't go to school from it. My anxiety was so bad I didn't get out of bed for days. Um, and when I tried to talk to counselors about it, they're like, oh, stop being such a dramatic teenager. Oh, my yeah. goodness. Um, and even, like, going through, like, the therapy that I did, it was interesting because you get called over dramatic. You get called, to stop making things up. And I've talked to so many people who have gone through, like, the same experiences that I did where you, you're not sure how to approach your own recovery because people are telling you that the things that are happening in yourself aren't real. Um, so that's why I found that sharing my story was so important. Um, and there's been so many times where people are like, you don't need to talk about this. This isn't something that's important to talk about. Um, but it really is because there's so many people that have met, every single person has mental health, whether it be stress, anxiety, um, but I mean, even all the range to mental illness, it's one in five Canadians have a severe mental illness that affects their everyday life. 
Wow. Yeah, that's true, though, especially when you're talking about the counselors, um, saying, like, oh, you're overreacting and stuff. I think that's something that makes it really hard for teens these days yeah. is that, like, they don't get the support that they, like, that they need in order to push past these challenges and stuff. And you were mentioning going through, you know, your depression and anxiety and your eating disorder. And how, if you don't mind me asking first, how, yeah. um, how did you overcome them? I can never say that I'm fully recovered. Yeah. Like... I don't think that there will ever be a day where I am fully recovered. And there's still some days I wake up and I'm like, nope, can't face the world today, I'm going back to bed. Um, but it's a matter of um, learning to love yourself. And this is something that has taken me 20 somewhat years to learn. The fact that it's okay to have flaws and that it's okay to be um, not 100% okay all the time. And it's something that we don't really see in our society at all. Yeah. There you go, and I'm glad that you're uh, like all like, positive and everything now because you're beautiful inside and out. Aww, and, oh, thank God. you. You're welcome. And uh, in contrast to that, how was life like for you when you were dealing with them at the time? Dealing with um, everything, it was it was hard. Um, there was a point I actually dropped out of high school, and I think that was the hardest thing for me. Um, I was homeschooled throughout all my grade 12 year. Um, and I was um, living in a treatment house, um, and it was, I guess the thing is they teach, especially with youth, they treat them very similar to adults, yeah. um, and the youth brain isn't fully developed, so it's very different. Um, and being pulled away from my family and everything was really hard for me at the time. Um, I'm really lucky that I have a family that is super supportive of me. Yeah. Um, I definitely wouldn't be here today if, like, my family had not, like, dragged me, like, to the hospital a couple of times and been like, oh, girl, you need some help. Um, but for me, it was, like, like, going through it, it was, it's hard to describe, but it's literally like somebody shot you in the chest, yeah. and it hurts so bad, but there's nothing you can do about it, and so you just want the pain to go away. Like, you don't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's definitely something that you should also know is that, like, like you were saying earlier, like family is like a really yeah. strong um, form of support that anyone can have. And again, with like the counselors and stuff, if they tell you anything as far as like you're over exaggerating and you're actually dealing with something, see someone else because like you're just gonna cry more, honestly, oh, yeah. right? And um, on your Facebook page for Faces of Mental Illnesses, I noticed you have like butterflies, right? Mm -hmm. And could you tell us a little bit more about the meaning behind the butterflies? Yeah, so um, we chose the butterfly as our logo, um, sort of for the reason that it um, becomes a butterfly. So every, you become the butterfly from starting as you know, the little caterpillar, and you go through a journey. And I think it's really important we acknowledge everybody's journey in life, um, and that's how you become the butterfly. That's so cute. That's so true, though. You know, you're all like squiggling, squiggling, finally fly. <laughs> Set yourself free. Feel the wind. Well, that's exactly it. And like a lot of times, we focus so much on ourselves yeah. that we forget everybody's journey. And yeah, that's so true. yeah, you're so like focused on hiding in your little cocoon. Oh yeah. And then when you finally fly, <laughs> you just flamboyant wings all around. <laughs> of mental illnesses. I know that you've been involved with other projects, other organizations and stuff. And could you tell us a bit more about which ones you're doing right now? Yeah. Um, so right now I'm really involved with a project called High Five. Um, <laughs> um, and it's um, at a university level. So it started at Simon Fraser University, because um, that's where I go to school. And I transferred there from Capilano University. And Capilano University is very small. We have maybe like 15, 20 people per class oh, and everybody's wow. really close. And when I transferred to SFU, um, I had massive. this, it's massive. You have like 300 people per class and like, there's this thing called the cooties effect, I call it. <laughs> so you sit down and then like, you'll be like sitting there and be like, great, somebody's gonna come sit next to me. They're gonna talk to me. 
But people sit like two seats away from you. Oh my gosh. So it's the SFU cooties effect. <laughs> you're just like, okay. You're like, oh man. Please lean maybe down maybe I myself. like forgot to like shower or something today. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's um, like that one scene from Twilight, right? When Chris Kristen Stewart, she like smells her hair. She's, yeah, like, she's like, what's what's going on here? <laughs> yeah. Um so I felt like really isolated and so I noticed that there was not really much at SFU in terms of mental health. I mean we have health and counseling services, but there wasn't anything to liaise between the students and the health and counseling services that we do have. So I got in contact with um, one of the directors of health and counseling services, um, and she was um, had this idea for a project called High Five. Um, and it was from there that the movement itself sort of started. It started as a campaign, and it had two things. It had a logo, which was the High Five Hand, and it had uh, um, the idea of a traveling diaries project. So the first thing we did was we spread diaries all around um, our three campuses, those three SFU campuses, um, for people to write whatever that they were feeling in them. And like we, anonymous? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Um, like there was directions inside, you know, write whatever you want, uh, leave it here, or just bring it back to this office on this date so we yeah. can find it. Um, and we got so many things that I, I guess I was not expecting people to be so open about. Um, we got lots of things being like, I'm sad, I'm frustrated. We got lots of pictures of cats for some reason. Woo! Oh yeah. I love cats. Uh, it was definitely interesting. Um, and like from there we saw, I guess that there was a definite need to keep it going. Yeah. So it sort of changed from like a campaign into like a movement. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Spreading all across the world. Yeah. <laughs> Doing good things. Spreading like a butterfly. <laughs> so, uh, for your um, your speeches, the public speeches yeah. and stuff that you do, what is the best feeling that you get from you know making a positive impact on the lives of others? Like, what is that moment that you're just like doing it? Oh, um, for me, it's really hard to speak in public. Um, I'm not really good with people. That's because of my I have like social anxiety, so it's always hard for me to get up in front of people and speak. But it's simply about the fact that we don't talk about these things and the fact that they're hearing um, other people have gone through it and other people have made it, been successful yeah. with um, mental illness and mental health. And yeah, you're like your little sunshine. Okay? <laughs> uh, what do you think is what makes teens you know, so shy to open up about any uh, mental disorders that they have? Yeah, um, I think a large part of it is simply... Um, the societal um, things that we put upon ourselves. Um, like I said earlier, we look at social media and it's yeah. simply like positivity from everybody else's lives or showing the best parts of everybody else's lives. And that's so true, like when you're seeing other people and all the stuff that they have, you kind of like sometimes, I think that's why like some teens, right, they feel so down because oh, they're yeah. like, I wish I had that. Oh, yeah. I mean, like everyone's felt like that and at some point. Right? Especially in teens, it's really bad because they're going through the whole like um, puberty and, puberty and mm -hmm. the whole like, I want to be cool, like why don't I fit in? They haven't yeah. found like, I know I went through the exact same thing. I was never a cool kid. Yeah. I was always like the one eating like lunch in like the theater by myself or with a couple of friends being like, yep. So where's the cool kids table? That's not me. <laughs> I had my phone. Exactly. Um, so it was like you want to fit in, so you don't want to have like this thing that makes you like this weirdo or this crazy person. If we raise more awareness about it, obviously, and there are more people that are open about what they have, because I feel like everyone's shelving it away because oh, yeah. of the stigma. But if people just go out there and say, "Hi, I have this," like. I hope that, you know, 20 years from now, not even, maybe like five, like as soon as possible, right. people will be talking about, like they talk about cancer and stuff. I think a lot of people don't realize that mental illnesses are actually like serious, right? They don't right. realize that they are, they can be life-threatening, right? Especially like depression, eating disorders, right? Yeah. And people just shrug it off because it's like, oh, you're, you're just thinking it, but it's like, no, exactly. you're literally like, your brain is literally like programmed to do this and think that way. Yeah, it's, like, I think... A huge part of it is because people can't see it. Yeah. Like with a broken moan, you get a cast. Yeah. You can show it off. Be like, oh my God, sign my cast. cast. Um, if you have like cancer, you can show, oh, look at this uh, picture of all these like dying, defeated cells or something yeah. like that. Or even with a cold, you have like a gross nose or exactly. anything like that or a cough. But with mental illness, there's nothing to show for it. Yeah. So you are like, yeah, 
um, I have an eating disorder and people are like, that's cool, you're not that skinny. That's so true. to successfully create an international advocacy to make this world less stressful and to turn these issues into an opportunity to offer support to others. Congratulations. That's something that I struggled with a lot was people being when I was like, yeah, you know, I'm struggling struggling with disordered eating. People were like, eh, you don't look like a model yet. You're not that bad. Or when I had like depression, people were like, ah, what do you have to be sad about? Look at the kids in like third world countries. And I'm like, yes, but you know, I'm like at any point like not going to be alive. And mm. it was a, it's the things like that that really are scary. <laughs> Mental illnesses are kind of like the silent killers, and yeah. you, you can't, most people won't really understand until they've dealt with it in some way. There's this huge misconception with eating disorders. It's like, you want to look like a model, you want to be skinny. Like, it was for me about control. Like, um, my depression and my anxiety came first, and I had absolutely no control over those. Yeah, I totally understand where you're coming from, yeah. So, ooh, shifting gear <laughs> to a positive note so that we don't get. Oh, yeah. Oh, Niagara Falls on our face. <laughs> You're wearing a beautiful sash. Oh, yes. And a beautiful crown. Princess. Princess Christine. <laughs> My fair lady. Can you tell us a little bit more about why you joined beauty pageants? I know that you're a very, very strong humanitarian. Did that, uh, was that part of um, what inspired you to, you know, go out there and share your advocacies? Um, actually, not at all. So I joined my first beauty pageant. Um, I actually hate to call them beauty pageants. Um, just I joined my first pageant um, a couple of years ago, and it was Miss BC, Miss British Columbia. And um, I was fresh out of high school, and I was still like going through a huge recovery stage, still struggling a lot, and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do at all, what my message was. Um, but I thought, like the way possibly for me to get over my anxiety was to stand on a stage in front of 200 somewhat people. Exposure therapy. Exactly. Did you find that it helped you to get your word across? It definitely did. I think, that, well, there's two things that people will think of when they think of pageants. Mm -hmm. um, and there was, um, you get a lot, the first thing is you get a lot more exposure. Yeah. Um, and then the second thing is it's both positive and negative exposure. Um, when, when I say, yeah, I do pageants, you know, I'm Miss Close to Vancouver, people are like, like toddlers yeah. and tiaras. Yeah. Uh, I'm like, eh, not quite. Exactly. Um, so it's been, it's been an interesting journey with pageantry. I'm so happy that it's been something that I've taken. Um, it's also been really nice to break a lot of the stereotypes around yeah. pageantry and I guess around um, fem females in general that come with it. Yeah, I feel like in pageants, like, you form, like, really strong sisterhoods yeah. and bonds, right? Like, from all, like, the pageant girls that we've had on the show, it's like, everyone's always like, and, like, we were, like, sisters and in the movie. Oh, yeah. You see, like, ah! like oh, yeah. Like, yeah. The crowd and everything, where it's like, in reality, oh, girl, I'm so happy. <laughs> it's like the also like the stereotype where it's like, what could you change in the world? World peace. World peace. <laughs> world peace. 
I'll sit and wave. I don't. I also don't wave like this. I do a lot of parades. I'm like, I don't wave like this. I'm like, hey, no, what's up? What's up? I know everyone's always like in practice, you have to be so finesse and proper posture and everything. But in reality, I'm like, oh. like at home, if it wasn't for the fact I'm wearing a dress, I would be so yeah. Man, just, just hey guys, spread out. Spread out. Be free, butterflies. Be free. Welcome back to Everything. We are here with beauty queen and amazing, inspiring humanitarian Christine Jameson. And Christine, before we get to the main part of the workshop, I have some quick fire questions for you. Hello. I'm going to ask you 10 questions and you have to say the first thing that comes to your head okay. as fast as you can. We have okay. a time limit, I believe. Three, two, one. Pink nail polish or red? Pink. Favorite animal? Platypus. Purple reminds you of? Flowers. Describe yourself in one word. Perfectionist. <laughs> Most important life lesson you've learned? Love yourself. Five words to describe your advocacy. I couldn't. <laughs> your word of the day? Purple. <laughs> Biggest obsession? Ice cream. Who would play you in the movie of your life? <laughs> we can still finish the question. Uh, the girl who plays uh, Cadmus on The Hunger Games. Jennifer Lawrence! Yes! Nice! I can see it. Five yeah. things you have at your purse at all times. Oh, five things I have in my purse at all times. Um, Sweatpants, tiara. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I actually carry more things in my car than I do at my purse. <laughs> like, my purse is usually pretty empty, but in the trunk of my car is, like, my life. Okay, five things you have in your trunk at all times. Five things I have in my trunk at all times. Sweatpants, heels, flats. Uh, I always have my phone on me. And... Um, well, that's one other thing that's in there. Oh, my yoga stuff. Oh my gosh, There's sweatpants, heels, and stuff. flats. You're like ready for life. I, it's, oh it's, my gosh. it's the complete um, kit that's of like anything kit. that exactly. could happen. You're, Any, like you're any ready event. for the apocalypse. Like oh, yeah. you have your sweatpants and your heels, if, which you can break off. Oh yeah, exactly. Use it as a weapon. And then you have your flats so you can just run, you know, run away from the zombies. Bye guys. Oh, Bye guys. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Okay, so our workshop is called Dare the Truth, and what we're going to do is one person will have a list of questions, and they're going to ask them a question, and the other person can reply with either the truth or the lie with a poker face. All serious. So serious. And the other person must guess, is it the truth or is it a lie? <laughs> Who do you want to go first? Oh, I'll ask you some questions first. Okay, and Terry, you ready? Okay. Did you ever break into dance in the middle of a mall? No. Lie. Yeah. <laughs> Man, this is so me. Did you ever have a crush on a video game or fictional character? If yes, explain. Um, yeah. 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 Yes. You know, there's a slight things such as uh, the 100. Yes. <laughs> Fictional characters yes. in that. Did you ever have a poster of Taylor Swift in your bedroom? Yes. No. <laughs> really? Yeah. I thought it would be like One Direction. <laughs> oh, well, I had like oh. maybe 50 of One Direction, but I had one. One Taylor Swift. Swift? You know, she was like, she was there. She had her own spot. Just like, she had a okay. shrine. Right there. The Taylor Swift shrine. That's what, <laughs> that's what was up. Do you like wearing gowns? Why? No, because they're extremely uncomfortable. Truth. False. I love Oh! I'm a pageant girl! I'm a pageant girl! <laughs> I, I don't think that there's any way I could not love, like, formal dresses. That's so true, though. You just feel so Beyonce I know. In them. That's the exact thing. I, I walk out, and I'm like, yeah, I'm flawless. Woke up like this. Woke up like this. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Did you ever have a crush on a member of One Direction? <laughs> no. What are you talking about? No, so false. So false. 
my bad. Have you ever worn shoes that were too big for your feet? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> especially you can't, for girls. Yeah, that's like, so true. You know, especially because you know, like, your feet like feel more pressure, I think, at night or something. Like they get bigger. They like swollen. swell a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so then like when you're wearing your heels, you know, you oh, yeah. have that duck walk going on in the morning, but then by night it's like, like full. Cool. Oh <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, did you ever cry over cartoon movies? No. False. So false. Lilo and Stitch. <laughs> I was gonna say Lion King. Oh, like the pause is dead. The what is that? Like wake up, Dad. Wake up. Let's go. Why are oh you my God, up? I'm called. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <that's a> <laughs> I just need a moment. Anyways, Christine, thank you for coming on the show today. I've had a blast talking about you from relatable deep questions <laughs> to serious fangirl questions <gasps> to tomatoes and cucumbers. <laughs> like, oh my goodness. No, I feel you. like you're like my new soul sister. Oh my God. <gasps> thank you so much for having me. All right. Thanks, everybody, once again for watching everything. Be sure to catch up with Christine on her Facebook page. And until then, I will see you next week.